Hey everyone, welcome to Out of Spec Guide. I'm Max and you join me today with two German luxury SUVs that may seem very similar, but they have some interesting kind of character distinctions. So we have on one hand, the Audi Q8 e-tron, formerly known as the e-tron. Alyssa owns the old version of this car uh, from Out of Spec. You can check out her videos on that. But the new e-tron, the Q8, is basically Audi kind of rebadging it, updating it, giving it uh, you know, more efficiency, more range, if you're familiar with the existing version of this vehicle. And then we have kind of an all new vehicle this year, the Mercedes-Benz EQE SUV. So this is kind of comparable to their GLE gas SUV, or you can look at it as the SUV version of their EQE electric sedan, if you're more familiar with that. A lot of accurate, a lot of three letter things going on there, right? Mercedes EQE SUV, which by the way, you can get as an AMG version. We're not talking about that today. We're talking about the normal either 350 or 500 trim. And in the case of the Audi e-tron, we're talking about the Q855, which is the base default powertrain. There is an SQ8, which is basically a faster, spicier one. But today we're talking about these guys, similar price range for these luxury mid-size German SUVs. We're looking at high $70,000 to $90,000 range. So don't take this as an extremely comprehensive video today. My time with these cars is limited, but I'm gonna do the best I can to go over pricing value, uh, buying, you know, what you get for your money and what kind of technology features and experiences these two cars are gonna give you if you're cross shopping them because they are very directly comparable, but they also have some very notable character distinctions I wanna talk about that I think is really gonna shift who's buying which one. So keep watching if you're interested in these cars and let's learn all about them. Let's start with an overview of the Audi e-tron. So like I said in the intro, this used to be called the e-tron, now it's the QA e-tron. Uh, so old habits die hard with me just calling it e-tron. But anyhow, this one we have is a prestige trim. So it comes in three trim levels. It starts at $75,000, goes all the way up to really like $90,000 range spec up. You can get this either in this trim, as you can see here, which is the normal e-tron, or the e-tron Sportback, which has a more of a sloped rear end. Um, I like this normal one though. Uh, the Sportback is more like coupe styling if you're into that. This is, like I said, prestige. It comes in three trims, premium, premium plus, and prestige. There is also a limited launch edition, which is the most expensive trim. That's kind of some cosmetic features. But for most buyers, I would just consider choosing between those three trims. And like I said, $75,000 to $90,000 price range. Now these are German luxury SUVs, so I'm not gonna exhaustively go over options and trims on these guys because I would be here all day. But hopefully that's a good overview of um, the rate price range, the trims you get. And in terms of technology, specs, all that, this has a big boy battery. So compared to the old e-tron, what Audi has done is given this more range. It's actually a little more efficient. So they've made tweaks to the uh, car's platform, even though it's the same platform as the old one. Um, what that means for you as a consumer is this is more range though because chiefly they gave it a bigger battery there's a 106 kilowatt hour net usable battery in this boy which is pretty big and honestly for the base price of 70 just above 75 grand uh, which does make this by the way um, tax credit eligible if you're leasing the vehicle um, not if you buy it but at that kind of price i think that is uh that's not a bad value just given how much battery you get and it's dual motor standard all-wheel drive quattro as Audi calls it um, and the power output from that is looking at something like I think it's very similar to the last one I'll put the numbers on screen here but with boost mode and gates 402 horsepower and 500 something pound-feet of torque it's a little bit less without boost mode but 0 to 60 on this is 5.4 seconds so it's a plenty quick capable uh, you know family hauler Let's talk about space and cargo on this guy before we get into the Mercedes, because I feel like that's really important with this overview. So when I look in here, you can see, okay, decent kind of comfortable seat room, not quite like super luxury with this cargo netting and stuff, but it's nice that the rear passengers have their own climate controls uh, and USB-C ports, a little lower than I like to see them, but hey, at least they're there. And you have, of course, a 12 volt socket. Uh, and in terms of interior materials, very nice. Of course, this being the prestige trim, it has the nicest materials. It has uh, ventilated and heated front seats. It has window shades in the rear. It has a side airbag option. What a very German thing. Uh, be and because of the side rear airbags, that package also comes with illuminated seat belts that you can see at night. And that's really cool. Uh, now, this isn't the Sportback, so I think, honestly, that's better for most people. Makes it a more practical shape, a little bit boxier. It's still not perfectly boxy, but it is somewhat. Uh, 
meaning that like you can actually fit a good amount of things in here, even with the rear seats fully folded up. You can of course fold them down and you have these convenient uh, releases for that as well, as well as cargo nets. And then if we look under here, we're gonna have a space saving spare, which is very rare on EVs, honestly. Like you don't see spares on EVs, luxury or economy. So it's kind of cool that Audi has this, you know, this innovative kind of uh, compact spare uh, wheel here for emergencies. That's super nice. It's so rare to see that on EVs and also a decent amount of storage space. Not the most in this category, but it is honestly not bad. It goes pretty deep. Um, and, uh, We'll close that. Okay, um, throwing this in technically to be correct, the Audi e-tron does have a front trunk, but it's very small, spaced basically for an onboard level two charger. Um, but yeah, it actually does have a front trunk, unlike the Mercedes, so that is something to note. Of course, it's not the nicest uh, environment. You can see, of course, all the electronics here, and it's not that much space, but it's there, and that's better than nothing. You open that, by the way, with the latch here, as you would in a traditional gas car. Um, so nice, at least, that the Audi does give you that. So just one more overview of the Audi here. This one, because it's pr uh, prestige, is sitting on 21 inch wheels uh, with the black optics package. I honestly don't think these wheels look amazing, but of course that's subjective. Most trims of this vehicle, unless you option that, you know, very top end package, you're getting a 20 inch wheel instead of 21 inch. And for range, that's gonna be better for most people, FYI. Now let's talk about the Mercedes. With Mercedes, let's start with powertrain since they it is a little more complicated. There's the 500, which we have today, and that's comparable. I'm glad we have it today because it's very comparable to the Audi. It's dual motor, all wheel drive, as Mercedes calls it, formatic. Uh, and this one makes, I think like 408 horsepower, similar to the Audi with its boost mode, but it's more sustained, more constant. It's like over 600 pound feet of torque. It scoots. Uh, the zero to 60 claimed on this is I believe 4.6 seconds. It's actually quite quick. Um, if you get the EQ, E350, then that is either single or dual motor. So interestingly, unlike the Audi, you have the option of specking this with rear wheel drive. But weirdly enough, you spec it rear wheel drive 350, that still costs more than the base Audi e-tron. So just from a powertrain perspective, this one seems to offer less value, but I'll show you there are some technology and features in here that I think are a lot nicer, but that is really conspicuous, something I wanted to note. Um, so the base EQE 350, which starts just under 80 grand, it's like 78, 79 grand, somewhere in there, is actually tax credit eligible whether you lease or buy it because this is built in America at Mercedes, I believe, Alabama plant. So that's really cool. Um, only half eligible, meaning it doesn't get the full 7,500 federal amount. It gets 3,750 because of the bodies assembled there, uh, but the batteries are uh, foreign as are so many batteries for EVs. But nice that it gets half of the tax credit. That's still cool. 3750 is not nothing, even for buyers of a vehicle like this, of course, if you meet the income uh, qualifications and all of that for the tax credit. This one sits on aero wheels today with the EQE 500. But uh, sorry, let's get back to powertrains, right? 500 is that all-wheel drive one. The 350 is the cheaper one starting at under 80 grand, and it is either optionable with single or dual motor. So if you get dual motor formatic, it's interestingly enough, same price, same battery. All of these have a battery around 90 kilowatt hours. So substantially smaller than the Audi's battery, uh, but they get not much less range if you're getting the 350 with rear wheel drive, it's kind of uh, more range real world than the Audi. We're looking at like 270 miles EPA. Audi is very similar, 280 nominally more, but from range tests and things we've seen so far, the Mercedes I think is a little more efficient. It has a higher MPGE rating um, in rear wheel drive particularly. The EQE 350 plus is that base rear wheel drive trim, but the EQE 350 formatic, no plus, basically sacrifices range. It goes down to like 240, 250 miles, but it has dual motor all wheel drive. Uh, and you can actually upgrade that one with an acceleration package to bring it zero to 60 time from 6.2 to like 5.3 seconds. It shaves off almost a second, which is nice. If you get the very base rear wheel drive 350, I believe it's like in the mid to high six second range, zero to 60, not really gonna be quick, but hey, if you want value and range, the 350 plus is the one to get 354 Matic, your cheapest energy all wheel drive. And the EQE 500, this one for that 4.6 second zero to 60 with you know lots of horsepower and torque. So that's the powertrain we're dealing with today. Uh, and then interestingly, you know, from an ergonomics point of view, I didn't mention this in the Audi, but charging, right? The Audi has its charge ports in the front 
uh, and it has, has an option on this one to have dual sided. So it has uh, on one of these sides, a fast charger. I believe DC fast chargers on this side, but on this side, you have a J1772 um, socket for home charging. So you could use this for home charging depending on how your garage is laid out, or you could use the one on this side. This is not standard on the Audi, it's optional, but I think that's just really nice. I wanted to note that uh, this is CCS port, but of course, because it's CCS, that means you don't have to use the DC pins. You could also charge it home on this side. So flexibility, power, charge port, which is a mixed bag. It, it's nice, it's luxury, it's cool, it's motorized. It's also a point of failure. On the Mercedes, you uh, get a more conventional charge port. Uh, I do like that it's manual, it's simpler. Uh, CCS on both of these vehicles, of course. Big distinction though, the Mercedes has a partnership with Tesla supercharging. So the Mercedes, uh, Mercedes-Benz has announced that basically, you know, starting 2025 model years, their cars will have the Tesla port North American charging standard built in. Uh, but even before then, next year in 2024, this car will be eligible for charging at Tesla superchargers. A big deal for those of us here in North America where public charging infrastructure is very mixed. Mercedes, sorry, Audi, which is part of Volkswagen Group, has not announced a similar deal with Tesla as of me filming this video. Um, so that's unfortunate. Uh, in, in terms of charging specs, for those of you who are on the nerdier end of things, both these vehicles reach a nominal peak of 170 kilowatts, and they both have fairly decent curves from everything I'm aware. I think they'll charge similarly. We're looking at 10 to 80% in the 30 minute range. So they're not gonna be the fastest chargers on the market. They're not like high voltage vehicles like the, um, Genesis GV60 and others, or Lucid Air or whatnot, but I think they're both perfectly fine chargers for being 400 volt cars. For those of you who are nerds, I think both of these are fine chargers, 170 kilowatt peak. It's not amazing, but it's, I think, a perfectly acceptable charge rate. But I would give the nod to, on charging to the Audi in terms of convenience, like ergonomically. I think it, I like that it's on the front and it's on both sides, but in terms of practical usability, Mercedes in the US having the Tesla partnership is a big deal. Anyhow, I got sidetracked. Let's talk about the trims on the Mercedes. So I introduced you to the powertrains, 350 plus rear wheel drive, 350 dual motor, 4Matic as Mercedes calls it, and the 500 which we have in front of us today, the very fast one. Uh, not the fastest, there's an AMG version, but we won't talk about today. But trim levels, Mercedes uh, has, I believe, premium, uh, so they start with premium, kind of like Audi. Then they have exclusive, which adds some technology, driving assistance features that you don't get standard in premium, uh, which you do get more driving assist features standard on the Audi, which I think is nicer. But Mercedes driving assist suite is really good. So if you get the uh, the one step up, right, the middle model, the uh, exclusive, then you get those. And then you can go all the way up to the pinnacle. And if you get the pinnacle EQE 500, you're looking at like $90,000, which is starting to approach the like starting price of an EQS SUV, a whole new class of, um, of luxury. So EQS UV has a wide price range and generally it's a few thousand dollars more expensive than the Audi. I would find they are comparable in price, but the Mercedes is a little bit more expensive. It's nice though, like how I mentioned, that this does get the US tax credit um, for you know, 3750 at least. In terms of looks and cosmetics between these two SUVs, well, you know, they're midsize electric SUVs. The Mercedes adopts their kind of flowy design language, but I think it works better, frankly, on their SUVs than it does on their sedans. I don't mind it too much. The Audi e-tron, the Q8 e-tron looks a lot like the old e-tron always has. They've made some trim updates. I personally prefer the look of the Audi. I just think it looks sportier, has more character, but that's kind of my take on it. Um, it kind of shows you the character of these vehicles. Even though the Mercedes has power, I would argue when it comes to the way the suspension is tuned and a lot of things, the Audi is just more sporty in its DNA. But we'll get into driving uh, an interior kind of driving experience bits later. I haven't talked about the cargo space of the um, EQE yet. So let's do that. Uh, so, oh, I just locked it, sorry. Cars get confused when they're left on and there's both key fobs in my pocket. Anyhow, uh, by the way, I do like on the Mercedes how, you know, even if these door handles are a bit complicated, it's cool they pop out and greet you uh, when the key's nearby. The Audi, if you've noticed, has these conventional door handles. Anyhow, back to the Mercedes and its interior. I find, you know, I'm not, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I can just tell you subjectively, having spent some time in both of these cars, this interior feels roomier for passengers, especially rear seat passengers. It just looks like there's more space here. However, unfortunate because of this EQE 
uh, 500 not being spec that well. There are no, you know, there's not an individual climate zone for rear passengers. You have to go all the way up to the pinnacle trim on Mercedes to get four zone climate, which is, I think, a bit of an upsell. But hey, it also adds their fancy fragrance and ionization system, which this one doesn't have. One nice thing though, the Mercedes does come standard with this panoramic roof, and that's cool. I believe the Audi does as well. Uh, now, if I look here, uh, USB-C ports, at least you get those. And you do get climate vents again, but they're just not separate zones from the front two occupants. Um, I would say materials wise, I kind of feel like the Audi interior felt more durable. I do like this light interior option on the EQE. Of course, you don't have to go with light. You can get darker interior options, but I find in general, the EQE interior is just more visible. It's a more kind of comfortable open space to be. Headlight wise, both of these, of course, standard LED headlights as you would expect in, what is it, 2023. Uh, the Mercedes, you get the same, um, digital lights but they get a big upgrade if you get the really fancy pinnacle trim on the audi i believe you only have to go to premium plus to get the really nice matrix led lights uh, the basic premium one doesn't have them but premium plus does and of course prestige will include that as well um so that's all of that but let's get into the cockpits of both of these cars and kind of just you know assess that experience so i'll start inside of the audi getting in the audi it uses, I've already started the vehicle, so when you get in, it'll actually be off. Let's simulate that experience. Both of these are traditional-ish cars in the sense they have a start and stop button. But if I start the Audi, of course, has the normal chimes, the Audi multimedia interface comes to life. And personally, I like Audi software. It's fairly responsive. They have this climate menu in the screen here. Okay, maybe it's a little busy, but it's always here and it's dedicated. Uh, and you can just go through different things here as well. It's a nice secondary screen to the main MMI screen here, which is very responsive, by the way. Uh, and I believe this has preconditioning for charging and those other kinds of amenities, uh, which is nice. The navigation still, maybe you want to use Apple CarPlay or Intro to Auto. Of course, it's an option in this car. And I believe both are wireless. You also have your nice kind of phone clip here with a wireless phone charger sideways, smart orientation, to keep your phone in there. Cup holders here. You have a very interesting gear selector. Um, every brand in electric cars seems to be approaching gear selectors differently. And Audi has definitely made a choice in going for like, you know, this big meaty like thing. Of course, to press park, you press this button in here, but reverse neutral drive, you kind of shift it in between. Um, and in terms of having a driver display, I don't mind the driver display in Audi. You know, a lot of people are fans of it. If you've been in an Audi at all in the last few years, this will be familiar to you and that you have a lot of customizability options to change the screens here, uh, to go between different layouts. Um, it's typical, you know, just German complexity. They give you a lot of different options. I like the more minimal kind of layouts, but of course it's up to you. You also have the option of having a full screen map I think in satellite view, it's kind of busy and ugly, but hey, maybe you like having that. So it's nice that you can do that. Um, and then of course, you know, it cycles through all of its information. Uh, general kind of comfort controls. This vehicle, you know, has very traditional approaches to that. Four window switches, unlike a, um, unlike the uh, Volkswagen ID4. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, nice and luxury in here. All the switch gear does feel quality. I, I will note Kyle made the note that, um, you know, Kyle and Alyssa, they have the old e-tron and he said it had these metal shift paddles. This new one has plastic ones. What are these, by the way, in an electric car, if you're not familiar? Uh, in an electric car, lots of them let you control the degree of sensitivity to recuperation, meaning in non-nerd terms, when you let off the accelerator pedal, how much do they slow down and auto automatically slow down by... Uh, recuperating energy through the motors, but in effect braking, but braking with the motors. Um, you may have he heard this called one pedal mode in lots of EVs. The Audi has no one pedal mode, but you can get close by pressing minus here to like sort of simulate a downshift, I suppose. And then of course you can go plus for less regen sensitivity, smoother regen, depending on your driving style. The Audi will creep forward, simulating a combustion car. So again, no one pedal, but it does have brake hold, which you know is nice. So if you hold the brake, at least it stays stopped. I would expect that in any car now, but it just felt worth mentioning. I think it is a big experiential difference once you're used to EVs, if you're used to one pedal driving and like it, it's not in the Audi. But generally, I like the steering. I like the like seating position of the Audi. Um, of course, seat control is on the sides, as is common with many cars. Uh, and you know, okay, the interior is a little bit more 
claustrophobic than the Mercedes, but it's quality. It's nice that you have details like, you know, the compass and the mirror here. And of course, a roof. It's not as panoramic, I will note, as the Mercedes uh, sunroof. So that is uh, definitely something to note. But yeah, overall, I've driven this very briefly in town, so I'm not going to give like expert driving impressions, but I will just say, it, you know, it's a, it's a, if you've driven an e-tron, this is similar to the Q8 e-tron. If you've, uh, you know, it, it's a nicely tuned German midsize luxury EV. It feels sporty. One more big note, um, you have drive selection mode. So, you know, they do let you have standard, I think standard, yeah, air suspension in the Audi. So when you go up and down on drive select, assuming I'm not in the backup camera, um, it lets me choose between these drive modes and I can choose them on the touchscreen. You have efficiency, comfort, uh, all road, uh, which is a little kind of off roady and then full off road, which, you know, does some traction control things and will raise the air suspension. Then you have auto, we'll choose between them. You have dynamic, that's sort of a sportier setting. This adjusts the firmness of the suspension, the steering feel, things like that. Um, the air suspension in here is tuned sportier for sure than the Mercedes. Even in comfort mode, it does feel firmer. Um, it's just overall a little bit more bent towards sportiness, but standard air suspension is really nice. And we'll get more into that when I get into the Mercedes. Um, but yeah, overall, just usable interior. Not a huge fan of this being super glossy, uh, but at least you won't touch it frequently. Of course, that's your electronic parking brake. But these surfaces are nice. This shifter, I think, is unnecessarily big and just odd, the like structure for it. But hey, that's your PRND selector. Sound system in here, by the way, Bang & Olufsen, uh, because this is a Prestige. You get that in Premium Plus, I want to say, in Prestige, not the base Premium trim. Um, it's okay. Uh, Kyle seems to think it's not as good as the old e-tron that he had, but uh, it's still a nice capable sound system. I think though the Mercedes with the Burmester is a little bit better. The Mercedes has a Burmester sound system, different branding. It has Dolby Atmos if you care about that. So spatial audio, super cool. The Audi's gonna chime at me and be mad because I'm leaving it on, but hey, it's an EV. I'm not making emissions. I'm right here, no one's gonna steal it. So we'll leave that on and let's get into the Mercedes EQE driving seat, see what that is like. So again, we have these non-traditional door handles, but when they work in practice, they're great because they open, they present to you. It's like you never knew that they you know, were unusual in the first place. Of course, in cold climates, I'm not sure how these will behave. The infamous example here is the Tesla Model S with those aerodynamic door handles that popped out and will get stuck in frozen climates. I haven't heard too many reports of Mercedes customers having frustrations with that, but I could absolutely see this being a point of failure. Anyhow, let's get in here and whoa, lots of white. This interior, of course, is specced just white. It's very light in here. I like it personally. It's really comfortable, especially in a warmer climate like Colorado can be in summer and even fall with all of the sun we get. Uh, then you have, like I said, compared to the Audi, more of a panoramic sunroof. It's really nice. And visibility, it seems like everything's taller. Like the belt line of this car is a little, you can even see from where my camera is pointed, right? It's lower than the Audi substantially. Uh, let me start the vehicle because it seems to have auto shut off to save power. Here we are greeted with the MBUX, Mercedes-Benz user experience. Let me turn the music off so we don't get a copyright strike on YouTube. Uh, you have your maps here, of course, but whatever else you want. Uh, this may look more impressive than the Audi MMI system, and it certainly is in the sense of like the screen's bigger. Uh, let me turn the fan speed lower. Sorry, don't want to blast you with that. Um, it may look more impressive, and the screens certainly are nice and they're flashy. I find the Audi is a little bit more responsive. Like this, okay, like it does a lot, but it's just it feels a bit less responsive, at least to me touching it. And I don't know, I get kind of finicky with car software like that. So maybe it's a more intuitive. Audi MMI is kind of like an expert system where people who like it, uh, really like it, kind of like old BMW iDrive. Whereas I feel like Mercedes-Benz, this is my opinion, the Mercedes-Benz UX, it's more kind of intuitive, very picture, like, you know, large display items, very friendly, very flashy, but a little bit slower and clunkier, uh, especially as you get to be an expert user. Of course, you can use Apple CarPlay and Android Auto in here as well. Um, like the Audi, this has dynamic modes for driving. So this has an economy mode, a comfort mode, which I feel like best suits the character of the car, uh, and then a sport mode as well as an individual mode, similar to the Audi, where you can customize different parameters of the uh, engine. It's funny, they have an engine icon. The the motor sensitivity to your accelerator pedal, the dampening comfort, the steering, and the stability control. 
This one has air suspension because it's nicely optioned. Not all Mercedes EQE SUVs have air suspension. It's a package you have to get. And I think that's kind of a, mm, that's a bummer because uh, I can say, you know, the air suspension in this car is really nice and comfortable. I don't know what the steel springs are like. I don't have them. But the fact that you spend as much money as you do on this Mercedes, which as I've mentioned, right, you get all wheel drive, uh, the 500 trim versus the Audi, it gets to be more expensive overall. And then you still don't have standard air suspension. I mean, okay, it's $2,000 to add. It's not an insane amount, but still I would like to see that standard, especially, you know, with this trying to be a luxury midsize SUV. It just feels like something I would expect in the segment. Disappointing. Apologies for me throwing this in there. I made a big harp about how the Audi has this big, overly large gear selector. Mercedes makes a very different interior decision. You can see offering you um, this kind of space in here, uh, USB-C ports. The Audi had those as well, but in a slightly different spot. Mercedes also has this very cool openable armrest with quite deep storage. But to do the PRND, you have to go here. Uh, and you can press park and then go in reverse and drive, but stock style, like an old American, like an old Suburban or something. So that's cool. That's how the Mercedes does it. I think it's a little more space saving. If you're used to Tesla, this is also what they do. And I kind of personally prefer this approach to what Audi does because that approach just seems so bulky and like it wastes a lot of space in this area. You can notice, of course, that you can cleanly um, close this area if you want a nicer look uh, and less practicality, if that's what you want to do. The Mercedes, a lot like the Audi, has these panels. They're plastic similarly, but minus and plus, right? They're changing the regenerative braking amount. This actually does let you do one pedal. So if you go into the strong recuperation setting, it is a one pedal effect. It slows you to a stop and you don't creep forward. I do like having that as an EV driver, but of course that's up to your personal preference. Standard equipment I do love in here, and even in my brief time driving, I've noticed, is rear wheel steering. So this has, I'm not sure if, I'll turn the steering wheel. I don't think you're going to see it when it's parked because it obviously behaves differently in motion. But the rear wheel, just imagine it turns, um, rear wheels will turn 10 degrees uh, to basically help with either stability at high speeds, they'll match the direction of the front wheels, or uh, in traffic environments low speed, they will um, move the opposite way and give this car a shorter turning radius. I've noticed this firsthand, just driving it briefly, and I love it. And it's standard, at least if you get the EQE 500. If you get the EQE 350 plus or 354 Matic, you do have to option it. But it is nice that in 500, you spend that money. I believe starting price of EQE 500 is well into like, you know, mid 80 grand territory. Nice that you get rear. Um, steering standard. Honestly, just weird content decisions. I would almost expect to see air suspension standard before rear steering, but hey, it's there. If you're getting this kind of trim, please do yourself the favor of adding that air suspension. Anyhow, in terms of controls, it's like the Audi. Uh, Mercedes being Mercedes though, they put their seat controls on the side in case you weren't familiar with that. Uh, so that's what this looks like. Lots of glass black surfaces. This interior, I will say, feels nicer and like it's very airy, but I can't I can see the Audi aging better and just being more kind of utilitarian. Uh, like this is so nice, this Burmester sound system. This seems like real metal. Um, you know, this, these trim elements are nice, but like when you actually touch them, some of them feel cheaper than you would expect. And then like this is just, this glossy surface is gonna look gross. I just know it. And then of course you have white seats, white steering wheel. I believe, yeah, this is real leather. So this TBD on how it'll wear. I mean, it's solidly put together. It's a Mercedes product, don't get me wrong, but I think it's going to be a little bit of a nightmare to clean, especially, I can't believe I haven't shown you this yet, the Mercedes trunk. By the way, they hide their backup camera here, kind of like Volkswagen, funnily enough, but that's cool. Uh, but when you open the power lift gate, yeah, look at this. Like, this is just, I know, like Colton from out of spec detailing would have a heart attack looking at this. This is going to get dirty. I can, like, already see it. Um, it's nice, but also, like, yeah, I'm a little worried. Just spatially looking at this, it seems like the Audi has a little bit like more trunk space, a little bit less passenger space. That's like my impression. I think they're very similar in overall size and dimensions, but what is it like under? It seems like the Audi gives you more usable space. Uh, this isn't as nicely presented as the Audi. You don't have that like folding storage box. You just have your emergency spare kit. Um, or, sorry, emergency tire inflator and sealant. You don't actually have a compact spare like you have in the Audi. Uh, and then, of course, that's batteries and other things packaged there. Hmm, so a little bit less space in that way in terms of packaging. But I think for what these SUVs are, I kind of prefer the Mercedes approach to just giving those rear passengers 
here we go with these door handles again. I've locked it, let's unlock it. Um, I kind of prefer this approach of just giving the rear passengers more room. I personally think that makes more sense. But again, if you're leaning sportier, if you want a mix of utility and kind of ruggedness that Audi is giving to you, the Mercedes is like a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's showy, it's flashy, it's luxury, it's airy, but I don't know how this will age. Maybe this is a lease machine. To be honest, maybe both of these are lease machines. This video has gone on a little bit longer than I wanted, but let me wrap it up with you and uh, tell you about which one I feel like you should buy based on who you are. Okay, thank you if you made it this far in the video and bearing with me and all of my rambling and uh, frankly, incomplete knowledge in some areas of all these cars. Again, I have limited time with them. I'm doing the best I can, but, and the other German luxury SUVs, they have so many options. I highly advise if you're buying either of these cars, spend some time on their configurator pages building options. The general things I can tell you that I know for sure are that the Mercedes gets expensive very quickly, has lots of options, overall a worse value just in terms of options and content. Audi is better in that way. However, the Audi has its disadvantages. It is less efficient, just uh, even in this new Q8, you know, e-tron generation as they rebadge it for this year, it's less efficient, meaning you're just going to be uh, having to spend a little bit more on electricity. Maybe that's not a big deal. Range is similar because the battery is so big and it's going to charge decently. Um, it has a pretty uh, well spec battery and uh, the onboard charger, by the way, for home use, if you get the dual charging ports is 19 kilowatts. For those, for those of you nerds who have high amp uh, breakers, rejoice. You're going to be able to charge those very quickly at home. Anyhow, um, but yeah, the Audi is going to be, you know, just, I think nicer functionally, but it won't have the like, luxury kind of feel of the Mercedes. I will say the Mercedes is just more comfortable and nicer in those areas. Rear steering in town is really enjoyable and Tesla supercharging. This would be so easy if Volkswagen were willing to like, you know, have some humility and partner with Tesla, but that hasn't happened yet. And in the US for American buyers, that's a huge deal. Also, uh, no tax credit eligibility when you're buying. If you're leasing, they will, I believe, do a capitalized cost reduction and lower your monthly payments. Um, if you get a base e-tron, you have to be very careful though to keep this car under 80 grand. But if you do, it's possible. With the Mercedes, um, it's also very hard to keep this car under 80 grand, frankly. But if you do, then hey, you buy it, you can get that 3750 tax credit. So that's kind of probably why they start the price just under 80 grand. So, you know, similar budget for these cars, expect to spend more for the same kind of functionality with a Mercedes. But if the badge means something to you, if you like the comfort, the airiness, the openness of it, then it has that. I do think I would personally go with the Audi, um, even though this Mercedes EQE 500 is faster. You saw the price tags. This Mercedes gets so expensive. This Audi at 91 and a half, you know, 91 and a half thousand dollars. It's out of my personal price range, but if it's in your price range, it's actually not a terrible value for what you get. Um, the old e-tron is also something to consider if you're, you know, more price sensitive then you should just be buying a used one. EQ SUV is very, is brand new. So you're not buying a used one of these, but for the Q8 e-tron, you can buy an old OG e-tron before it was called the Q8. And a lot of those models, nice ones are just, you know, depreciating like stones and they're still nice vehicles in many respects. Okay. They're less efficient. They have less range than this one. If you're not road tripping all the time, if absolute range doesn't matter that much to you, consider those because they're also monster chargers just like this one is as well um, and so I think those could be really compelling anyhow I ramble on enough in this video I hope this gives you a good picture of these two um, SUVs again I, I picked the Merc the oh, sorry the Audi e-tron Q8 Q8 e-tron because of my taste I like that it's just more value for the money uh, it's sporty enough for me okay EQE 500 has a faster zero to 60 but it just doesn't feel as sporty doesn't feel as fun um, but I can totally see buyers going for the Mercedes if they want the more of the luxury approach more of the niceties maybe you prefer also the interior and the Mercedes-Benz user experience to Audi's MMI all that um, but yeah technology wise these you know SUVs are packed to the gills with it. Driving assistance features are comparable. I would say Mercedes is slightly nicer with their implementation, but if you're getting a well-trimmed one of these, you are gonna get all those features. Uh, I believe the Audi is actually standard all the way with the adaptive cruise. Mercedes, you won't necessarily get it base. They make you add it. So again, more options, slightly less value than the Mercedes, but as long as you spec it right, Mercedes can be really nice. Audi just keeps things a little bit simpler, at least in having one powertrain, a good value in that respect. You can tell by now, that's the car I prefer. But I think I've, hopefully this is a good argument. 
for both cars. I'm gonna stop rambling now. Please let me know the other questions you have in the comments, other things, you, kind of content you'd like to see. Uh, our time with these cars is limited, but do look on Autospec Reviews and the other channels uh, because I'm sure there will be range tests and other content performed with these cars in the time we do have them. And let us know generally what other kind of content you want to see in Autospec Guide. In this long, overly long video, apologies, I've been Max uh, presenting and I'll see you in the next one.